Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the edition of Divs, Desert Island Vids, without the desert or the island, but we have some crappy videos. Uh, and we're here today with Helen Mason. Hello, Helen. Hello, person I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we've, never, we've never met before. Can no. <laughs> Helen, could you tell us who you are and what do you do? Right, well... My name is Helen, we've established this part. Um, I am a counsellor at Open Minds Counselling Service, but I also am the managing director of it and one of the people who first created it. So is it a charity? It is, yeah. We're a, well, I say we're a small charity in Doncaster, but we're massive in some ways. There's 15 employed counsellors, about 30 volunteer oh. counsellors, and we work with between 100 and 200 people a week, both children and adults. So the children, wow. we start at the age of eight and it goes through to a million years old if somebody wanted to refer wow. themselves. That, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a large um, counsellor base and a li large count client base. How on earth do you manage all that? Well, usually my head explodes once a week. <laughs> <laughs> um, in practice, we actually used to work with a lot more clients and actually we found it unmanageable. So we have six therapy rooms and um, it's obviously it's a lot of admin because it's not just the one counsellor goes into a room with one client. It's also making sure that that client is then safe and if there are safeguarding issues in their family or with themselves or if they don't need safeguarding in the sense that they are suicidal or that there are children at risk that there's support in other types that they might need so if they're struggling with food poverty or alcoholism or something like that that we can try and if we don't put it in place for them that we can get them the right support from elsewhere so it's not just we see someone for an hour and then we forget they exist there's all the stuff in the background so it's like if the therapy session is the the swan on top of the water, the other stuff around it is the little legs powering <laughs> across the, the pond sort of thing. So so it's a it's very I don't know, it's we've got a very, very good team who all work together really well. We're we're just absolutely blessed that everyone has the same heart, the same approach to how we're gonna operate, and that's just to try and do the best that we can. And I apologise for my little shouty dog. I think his ball has fallen under the TV. <laughs> he wants, he wants counselling. He does. <laughs> he needs therapy about his ball going under the TV. <laughs> so, so that's not, they're, they're not small numbers we're talking about. And if we multiply them as well, over time, how, how did it all start? Well, when I was training to be a counsellor, my partner Craig and I met on a 10-week introduction to counselling and I thought, oh, he's quite nice, actually. I might he is. him. I, I must, I must butt in there and say he, he is a very nice fellow. He's a very nice man. <laughs> and, uh, and I was at the time working at a community centre. I was the fundraiser there. And in, in my office, the office that I shared with some of the other people, we had basically a broom closet and they let me turn it into a counselling room. <laughs> it's pretty much stereotypical for a lot of charities in fairness. Oh, look, there's a broom closet over there. Let's, let's repurpose it. <laughs> so that was our first ever therapy room. And what we found was, because Craig and I started to just offer it around my hours, and obviously he was coming in as a volunteer at the time, and uh, and we found that instead of people from the local community coming in to see us because they didn't want to walk past the volunteers who lived in the community who they knew and sort of be seen to be going upstairs for counselling kind of a thing we started to get referrals just from all over the place because certainly at the time there wasn't another service outside the nhs that would just work with anyone of any age on any issue um and it just sort of grew basically so in 2008 we had the opportunity to get our own premises um an organization called street reach and victim support had just moved out of the building that open minds now occupies uh, because i think it wasn't big enough for them um they moved somewhere else and just 
left a, an almost empty building except for the the landlord which is the disabled people's alliance and they said look n almost none of our our volunteers can get upstairs anyway if you would like to take over the upstairs first floor and second floor you're very welcome to and so we went in and my mum and Craig and I painted and emulsioned over and and sort of turned it into something and then it just sort of grew from there so it was just me and Craig as the only volunteers we just two counselling rooms at the time and then it sort of expanded to the point that a couple of years ago about five years ago I think we got funding to turn what was the attic into three counselling rooms and so yeah so it's gone from just Craig and me being the only counsellors seeing maybe like 20 people a week and sort of going we can't sustain this to now there's like between 30 and 50 counsellors in any one week not all at the same time and six counselling rooms well it's a <coughs> I find it quite a <clears throat> uplifting and an amazing story and uh, I've been quite privileged to join you on some of your journey mm -hmm. uh, both as a person who receives counselling and let's not have any stigma about this yeah. uh, so not only that but I, I've also been privileged to help with volunteering haven't I and it yeah. makes a lot of sense now why we couldn't get you out of Narnia this is the one. I'm just obsessed with broom closets, basically. <laughs> and other people won't understand, but we've been trying for years to get Helen out of the broom cupboard, which she describes as Narnia, which was her office. But it was a broom cupboard, and she she finally winkled her out this year. <laughs> reluctantly, very reluctantly. <laughs> so what's your first yes. video, Helen? My first video is Aha, Take On Me, which particularly as a, I can't remember when it came out, but I remember it sort of having an impact on me as a young teenager and sort of the idea of this fantastical love story coming out of nowhere. Classic teenage girl stuff, really. Well, I remember it and I'll probably get beaten up for saying I like it, but I do like it. <laughs> and at, quite and at the time I thought it was quite a... Um, What's the word? Uh, where you're confident. Builds up your confidence. Yes. Yeah. 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 It sort of inspires you and says, look, do you know what? Good things can happen spontaneously. Yeah. And I'm strong enough to deal with them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, OK. Well, beautifully linked there. Strong enough to deal with them. What is counselling? What, 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 just what is it? Is it some sort of strange demon demonic practice? Yes, definitely. <laughs> we can read people's minds and they come into the room and we go bing and they're all sorted. No, that's what people are frightened of, generally speaking. People, people come into counselling and they have an expectation that we can read their minds or that um, they will open the floodgates and never be able to close them again. And what we tend to say, hold on a moment, can I, can I pause and deal with my slightly manic demon dog. Yes, of course. I will be back in, you've got a view of my ceiling now. Okay. <laughs> Whilst Helen's gone, because we, we don't have the uh, luxury of video, video e editing, uh, they do a marvellous job uh, out there. Oh, she's back. We'll stop talking about her. Uh, hello, are you back? <laughs> <laughs> you may continue talking about me. I'll pretend I'm not here. <laughs> so we're talking about what counselling is. Yes. So, so people are terrified that they'll open the floodgates and it'll never, ever stop. But actually, if you have spent 30, 40, 60 years building those floodgates, actually, if anything opening them up in drips and drabs is a good thing and it almost never happens that people lose control completely counseling is at that person's pace particularly the way we offer it to open minds it's not time limited in the sense that you can come for six sessions and that's it we expect you to be completely sorted we say we offer 10 sessions first so that people can come and slowly start to explore things and that might be all that they need so each session is an hour long and it's basically 
that the counsellor is someone who's been trained to listen, which might sound like the easiest thing in the world, really. And, and if it's in your nature, it just is. It's just something you can do. But in practice, it's about finding the right ways to help the client open up. So the client is the person who is coming, who actually has something that they want to talk about, that they want to address with somebody who's not a family or a friend somebody that they feel that they would have to protect from what they're saying so there's a lot of people who and I'm not talking necessarily massive trauma some people will come with some of the like darkest possible life experiences and then for other people it's something that they just don't understand about themselves or they just don't understand about the world or something that they're struggling with in terms of making a decision whether it's staying with a person or staying with a job or something that they want to change in their lives and they either don't know how or they're not sure they're ready to make that choice and the counsellor helps them explore all the different parts of it in a way that you can't necessarily do on your own because all the different parts of it you are getting a different type of feedback from your counsellor who will not tell you what to do, but they'll help you work out actually what do you most want to do? What are the consequences of that? And, and help you build the resilience to deal with those consequences. So if you have for a long time fancied your best mate, but actually you're really happily married and you quite fancy an affair but you don't know if you should and you know you shouldn't that kind of stuff the counselor isn't going to go what a horrid person you are why would you even think about this they'll help you look at all those things what's pushing you into a place where you want to do that what's making you feel either unsatisfied or unfulfilled is it that you're craving excitement is it that actually you want to sabotage things because you don't think you deserve the happy family life or is the happy family life an illusion and actually that's not happiness and the person that you fancy may simply be a promise of better things whether it be them or the possibility of, do you know what, actually I'm just not happy at all. Why am I so sad in what should be a perfect 2.4 white picket fences life kind of thing? And the counsellor helps you go through all those different things, but doesn't shirk on the, and actually there will be a consequence to the other people in your life with this. But they don't do it in a guilt-inducing way. They do it in a well, actually, yes, we need to look at the reality of what this decision will mean for you, but also for the other people in your life. What are the consequences? And actually, what are you responsible for and what you're not responsible for? That kind of thing. Yes. Uh, as, as someone who's received counselling, I, I would say that's very important. It, it, it's like validating what you feel. Mm -hmm. And then exploring that in, in as, as many ways as possible, really, looking at the ramifications of decision making and, and warped thinking quite often in my case, I, I think, you know, that my, my thoughts get so jumbled up and so mixed up inside myself that I don't know what I mean. Mm, absolutely. And that's the thing. We all have, for all the psychologists sometimes will say well you have an internal thought process and that is your inner dialogue but actually there are so many layers of that aren't they and it's, it's in some cases it's more like 12 radios playing at the same time and there might be valid messages coming from two-thirds of those and some of them aren't valid but they're important and it's important to actually hear them and go do you know what that message is coming because of this teacher who used to tell you this or this person in your life who particularly devalued you and actually turned that radio on for you then. But let's look at if we can't turn the radio off, can we turn the volume down and can we learn to say, do you know what? Yes, I know where that's come from, but that's not me. It'll always be part of me but it's not all that I am. And that's not my story. That's just one of the chapters. Nicely put. 
Nicely put. I will mix my metaphors between <laughs> radios and books. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, as we've gone on, so as we've moved on now, what about your second video? What's that one all about? Oh, that would be uh, Offspring, Pretty Fly for a White Guy. All the girls say, I'm pretty fly for a white guy. <laughs> now that surprises me. That choice does surprise me, Helen. I think we're going to have to explain it more. <laughs> right. It's, it's, offspring is not a group I would particularly listen to. You see, I'm terrible with music. I don't even know whether to call them a group or a band. So, <laughs> I am like musically illiterate, although I am wearing my T-shirt. Well, you're on the right channel. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so I really like Offspring. When it came out, I, well, I am still a massive Buffy fan in fairness. Um, but when it came out, I can't remember if it was associated with a particular movie or anything like that. But the main guy who is in the video was supposed to be played by Seth Green, or at least that was a rumour that I read at the time. And Seth Green played Oz in Buffy, and he's my favourite Buffy character. It's just like the world's most laconic, laid-back, just sweet character sort of thing. And uh, I could very much see him playing the the dorky character in the uh, in the video. He's um, for those who don't know who Seth Green is, he's the son, Doctor Evil's son, um, in the Austin Powers movies. Who's just like, why are we building a shark tank? I've got a gun. What are we doing? Kind of thing. <laughs> His favourite sort of voice of reason kind of character. <clears throat> and uh, does I think the robot chicken animations as well that sort of thing but uh, I just I just found it just ridiculously funny and hilarious and very much as a as a video as a song story it really does tell what teenagers are like that we're all these bizarre creatures subject to constant humiliation that is basically teenage life <laughs> I, that I like thing that of, description too. This is it. Oh, good! I'm going to be the coolest person ever, and then you go, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> as you slip over, <laughs> or walk into a lamppost. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. This is it. <laughs> so yeah, I, I just love the the way it portrays all of that, and that this this kid, this young man, is just so self deluded that he just has no real clue. <laughs> oh. Bless him. So you want to counsel him? So Yeah, look after but, him. <laughs> so do you, do you do a lot of work with children? We do. As an organisation, we do. I always have through the years, but at the moment, well, obviously at the moment, I'm like at home. But <laughs> I'm on lockdown. But uh, for the last good few months, um, at least since Christmas, I've not actually had any any children clients at all or really this year um been a counsellory person much purely because managing the organization and trying to get us to the point of sustainability which is a wonderful word but uh, the nature of being a charity and the way that we're funded is um we rely on grants and different organizations to give us money much like punk for the homeless really you either get grants or you get donations from individuals um and we tend to not get as many donations from individuals as we do i spend lots and lots of time uh looking for big funding from different organizations like at the moment we have the lottery funding us and that will last for three years and right now even though that's like two years away I'm spending my time trying to get the future so I love counseling it's why I got into it but I'm not doing it at the moment and and the counseling of children is just an absolute joy lots of counselors get frightened of it and some are frightened because they're worried it's going to push the mum button or the dad button and they're just going to want to take the kid home sort of thing and sometimes it does but you also have to be very honest with kids and say look if I was your mum or your dad, I would not be giving you my sort of uninterrupted devotion in the same way that you get for this hour. 
because mm. we would be arguing like parents and children do and I'd be expecting you to go to school and I'd be the person telling you to do this that and the other whereas for an hour a week we can talk about whatever makes most sense to you or no sense to you and you get to be the adult in the room explaining how adults think sometimes why adults make certain decisions and why certain things are yes inherently not fair but they're also not necessarily the fault of the adult um so like well why do we have to go to school for 8 30 like well kind of because if you don't your parents are going to get a whacking great fine <laughs> but, but that sort of stuff and and also why some of the decisions that their parents might make when they're disciplining them yes are genuinely unfair um but it's not about the child helping the child see that it's not that they're not good enough yes they might be naughty sometimes but it's not that they're not good enough as a person a lot of i mean it's true of adults most of the stuff people come to us with ultimately comes down to why am i not good enough and it can be layered under piles and piles of crap like fossilized geological layers or with kids it can be just under the surface and you can see it but you have to help them chip away to get at it until mm. instead of there being a poison under the soil they've learned to grow flowers oh. And that, that's actually been one of the uh, things I've been privileged to be a part of, isn't it? With the <clears throat> one of the kids groups there, the art therapy, yeah. art nurture group. And it really, art was, nurture. Oh, it really, really did emphasise the nurture, didn't it? Absolutely. This is it. And, and letting, letting kids, especially in the group, <laughs> letting them tease the adults and tease one another because they're safe to. They're allowed to, like poor Julian, who's our art therapist, constantly being teased by the fact that we're taking the art out of the art and nurture group and only having the nurture, that sort of <laughs> thing. <laughs> Calling him Susan, that sort of stuff. <laughs> just, that's fine. He, he looks good as a Susan. There's nothing wrong with that. And, uh, and it is. It's just doing what works for them. So a lot, a lot of like one-to-one -one work with kids is building their self-esteem, but it's also helping them understand the world differently and then the group work is is just finding different ways to let them know that they're valued and and deserve to be part of the world and offsetting some of the sometimes rubbish parenting experiences that they've had and other times um bereavement or stress or bullying at school whatever it is that they've gone through letting them know that there are better parts of life and hoping it sinks in into positivity absolutely absolutely and time's run away with us believe it or not we've been nearly 30 minutes of this so my goodness i'm going to ask you for your last vid and then i'm going to ask you one last question so what's your last video helen Ooh, um christopher walken dancing in the fat boy slim video what's it called oh i can't remember what it's called now weapon uh, of choice yes i think it is i i know I can, i've got the video in my head yeah that's it just how uh, someone who you think is just uh, i suppose again this laconic slightly sinister often gangstery type person who just sits there and all of a sudden he's just got the moves <laughs> and i just like the idea that it's showing you under the surface and uh, and just what's on the surface is rarely quite exactly all that's there <laughs> Well, isn't that the truth? Isn't that the Definitely. truth? And um, my last question is going to bring us rattling right up to date. Oh my goodness! COVID nineteen. How do you? I've heard how, of how do you? How are you coping with it as a family? How is the charity coping with it? And um, do you have any predictions? Ooh, my psychic powers. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I'll start with how we're coping as an organisation. So the first week um it was the tuesday before really they properly applied real social distancing i think it was the 23rd of march um i made the decision that we were all going to start working from home not really knowing it was going to turn into anything else um just thought you know what i don't feel 
that it's safe enough asking people to come and sit in small rooms <laughs> with us basically where we are too physically close to each other um so we all started working from home but i then had to effectively recreate open minds which was incredibly difficult because it wasn't as simple as just okay go home and talk to your clients it was okay actually we have two phones as an organization and one of them's a landline <laughs> mm -hmm. we can't all share the mobile um how are we going to schedule this how are we going to get in touch with clients and the ethical ramifications of it because counselors who are parents with young children like myself will really struggle to sit and have a long conversation it's a miracle we're managing this in fairness my little man's upstairs reading his, his dad's on uh, wrangling duties <laughs> but uh, um to sit and have a serious conversation my house is too small for me to easily know that i'm out of earshot of tiny ears that hear everything mm -hmm. um so there was a lot of working out who was going to be able to do it not just who was willing but who was gonna just physically be able to have the brain cells time and space to do it and all the insurances and all the stuff to do with that. But it wasn't just us doing that. Nearly every other organization in the country, I think, was ringing the insurers at the same time. So I was spending 90 minutes on hold to the insurance company because it's not home working. It's not like I had suddenly gone, I think on Tuesday, I'll work from home. It was me going, right, as an organization was shut, all of you go home and we will find ways to enable you to work from home. So it was very different to what we are insured for. And I had to set us up so that we had a different, slightly different type of insurance so that we could then ensure that everybody who was still working was safe and that we were insured if there were any problems or anything like that. And then the same with the HR company, the working from home policies and all the stuff that you have to have as a responsible employer. So all the rigmarole really, uh, we had to have all that done before we could start contacting clients properly. Because if we'd started working with clients from home without all the insurances and all the other stuff and somebody had suddenly decided to sue us, you would have just shut us down completely as a charity. Um, so that took the best part of a fortnight, getting all the paperwork in place. Whereas if it was just me wanting to wander off and talk to clients, I could have probably done it fairly simply. But we are massive in that sense. So it had to be done to dot every I and cross every T so that if there were any, whatever you'd say, Issues. come back yeah if there were any issues that we were as protected as we possibly could be for them um so then after that it was basically a fortnight of trying to contact clients finding out who could take up the service who wants to some people are key working and just don't have the brain cells bless them they're exhausted from work and for all that they might like to talk when they actually get home their heads are either too full or too empty um, other people are like like me, parents with ickle people at home and they just don't have the space. So for all that they might need to talk to somebody and, and vent and let off steam, they just don't have that guarantee of any sort of level of privacy. And it just embarrasses people or stresses them further if they're trying to talk to somebody in that sense and some little voices appearing in the background kind of thing or yeah. stop doing that to your brother kind of stuff yeah. which doesn't doesn't help when you're trying to like unwind in a counseling session <laughs> or whatever is involved um so yeah so that was like incredibly stressful but touch wood we are slowly getting there now we've got 20 just under 30 i think clients who have taken it up and about the other 70 that we've managed to get in touch with either can't or they just aren't ready for it right now. And if any of you have heard of the hierarchy of needs, it's like a triangle um, developed by Maslow, who is a psychologist. And it's the idea that you have to deal with the foundation of 
biological and physical needs first, then sense of safety before you can start dealing with love, family, belonging and self-esteem and self-actualization. So for a lot of people, they're just in survival mode and that's fine. It's where they need to be. It's that bit of if you don't know if you are well enough, if you're safe enough, if you're financially secure enough to deal with stuff in your life, then you don't necessarily right then want a counsellor saying, so how do you feel about that? And that's what people are sort of expecting us to do, I think, which we mm. wouldn't be doing. We'd be going, okay, so you're actually struggling with food poverty right now. Uh, here's some good links and resources. It, it's different to face-to-face in-person counselling at the moment. There's as much a support role as there is a counselling role because inherently people are having to go, right, okay, so this is something that needs addressing. Then you can't get your medicine. Where do you live? Right, you live in Thorn. So this is a pharmacy near you that can actually deliver that kind of stuff. No, that's marvellous. Is it? So we've been uh, having to ad- adapt in a little bit of a way and sort of move a bit of a juggernaut. It doesn't feel like you're a juggernaut when you're set up in the office, but it does when you're trying to recreate it from people's houses with terrible internet connections. In your um, broom cupboard. Yes, in my broom cupboard. I don't have a broom cupboard at home. <laughs> <laughs> or I do, but it's full of shoes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which it should so, be. <laughs> yes, this is true. And brooms, presumably. <laughs> um, how are we coping as a family? Touch wood. We, we haven't had any major rows. We've all had the occasional tantrum, but no epic meltdown so far, which is good. My partner, Craig, has a brain injury. And uh, so he really struggles with routine changes and things like that. So we've, right from the beginning, before all of this properly hit, he and I had had a conversation that... If Sam, my son, was off school for any length of time, uh, Craig would stay upstairs in the morning. So he has the penthouse suite or upstairs, as it's known. (laughs) So he's in our bedroom watching TV or doing whatever he wants to do until dinner time. And uh, I make dinner. We all come together as a family. And then for a couple of hours he and Sam do their thing while I do whatever bits of work I couldn't get done in the morning and in the morning Sam and I either I'm working on the laptop while he's doing some of his school work or something like that or the two of us are are doing a random project or something like that so touch wood hold on to a tree Mm -hmm. we've managed to to cope in that regard we keep having our (sighs) moments but that's just because we're human and, and sometimes just times when everybody needs to be apart, where everyone's a bit like, I want to do this. Oh, I just can't be bothered to do anything. And we all just wander off to play on Xboxes or read or potter or do something together and separately and all those things. So finding your coping strategies. Mm, this is it. And letting ourselves do that as well, which is good, I think. And keeping in touch with other people. Mm inadvertent zoom sessions or facetime sessions occasionally (laughs) our finance officer was playing with facetime uh, yesterday the day before and inadvertently like rang a load of us which is nice (laughs) (laughs) that's quite sweet and uh, and various things like that and we have uh, certain teams that are managed so i'm in contact with them periodically and sometimes they're just like zooming each other or facetiming each other sort of thing and then other times they're specifically asking for my input and stuff like that so it's been quite nice i've not felt isolated so much in that sense because i have had lots of people just to to chun to to or people to check in with and things like that the only sort of isolation that's big is from my parents because they're older and my mum has an autoimmune condition so i have been to see them but only in the sense of like going to the bottom of their garden and going, hello, kind of thing. And, uh, and that's weird. I always feel a bit weepy after, after seeing them, but not seeing them in the same way kind of thing. Yeah. This is the one. Yeah. There was a third part to your question, but I've forgotten what it was. Oh, psychic powers. What are my psychic powers? Well, we're, gonna, we're just going to have to bring you back another, the, another day for your psychic powers because we've run out of time. Mystic Meg. Mystic Meg Hour. (laughs) And uh, thank you for wearing that wonderful (laughs) t-shirt. You're on the money. 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> and thank you very much, Helen. Helen of Open Minds, Doncaster Counseling Charity. Any last messages, Helen? Everyone stay safe and be kind to yourselves and to everyone else. Oh, I, I, and I support that wholeheartedly. And uh, thanks for tuning in to Divs, everyone. And uh, while I try and look for the stop button, I shall waffle. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> until until next time, be well, everybody. Goodbye for yeah. now.